30 years ago, I had the honor and pleasure of being asked to join a new band that Kevin Johnson was forming in the D.C. area. It came to be known as Kevin Johnson and the Linemen. Kevin and Eric Brace had already been playing together as a duo for a while, and I'd met both of them individually over the few years prior to that while trying to insinuate myself into the D.C. scene. In the late 80s and the early 90s, our respective bands often ended up in the same clubs. Eric had a couple of bands, B-Time and The Beggars, and had started a label called Top Records with a couple of other fellows. Kevin was fronting the Revelaires, and I had met him then when my band at the time, The Invoices, split a bill at a local club, and we became friends. At the same time, Antoine Sanfuentes was drumming with the pickups, and I think we'd all uh, borne witness to his Andy work at some point during that time. So we all ran into each other in this way, uh, and by and by, and musical friendships and alliances formed as they want to do. And by 1991, uh, most of the earlier groups we were in had either disbanded or we weren't affiliated with them anymore, and Kevin pulled us all together, uh, as I recall, around the spring of that year. I was tickled to have another gig with good players whose material I respected and company I enjoyed. And we had some really cool shows right out of the gate, but I never would have uh, predicted that within a few months I'd get to spend some serious quality time with those guys in the closest thing in my mind to a musical holy temple. John Alasia, a superb DC musician and engineer then, had recorded some of our first demos at his home studio in Arlington, but he really managed to pull a rabbit out of his hat with five days of studio time at Ardent Studios in Memphis in early November of 1991. We went down there to record the first full-length Lineman CD, Memphis for Breakfast, over a five-day stretch. I'd completely forgotten that someone had packed along a video camera to document the proceedings, and it's quite an experience now to see us all really half our lifetimes ago at this point, courtesy of Antoine's uh, archival caretaking. If you're a rock musician of a certain age, our age, I guess, with an inclination toward um, primordial indie artists like Big Star and Alex Chilton and The Replacements and any number of other artists that influenced all that uh, jangle and bash and pop of that era, well, along with being the kind of geek that pours over liner notes and credits, then Ardent was a North Star. There's a lot of history out there on the interwebs if you want to do some heavy research, but the main thing is that for us, it was a really big deal that we were going on a pilgrimage down to mystical, mythical, musical Memphis on the Mississippi to, to cut this CD. I think at that point we'd all recorded in professional studio environments, but just speaking for myself, I'd never been in a big iconic one like Ardent. And, you know, mind you, we didn't have the luxury of doing what big-name artists with a lot of rent money or big-label budget do, which is, like, rent out a studio and practically live in it, creating and tweaking and fussing and fighting over weeks and weeks with a producer helping you expand your creative horizons, push you along, and will mostly keep you from killing each other. We all had day jobs that we'd taken a bit of time off from around an extended weekend. At least Antoine and I had the luxury of flying down and back to do our bits, and the two of us weren't even in the studio together at any point during all of this. He was in the first couple of days cutting rhythm tracks, and I flew in just as he was flying out to do my guitar and vocal tracks. Eric and Kevin were there the entire time, and drove a truck down and back with, uh, you know, full of gear. We had five days to record and mix 11 songs, so we'd rehearsed and performed the material we were recording enough in advance that we could go in knowing it cold. And maybe we could get creative with a solo here and a vocal part there, certainly try out you know, different guitar and amp combinations to get a particular sound, but mostly we were just barreling through things as expeditiously as possible. Recording in a studio entails long stretches of time engaged in uh, activities akin to watching paint dry, occasionally interspersed with moments of actual playing and singing. Professional engineers are a combination of um, artist, technician, surgeon, psychologist, coach, taskmaster. The best ones know their rooms intimately. They know the live spots, the dead spots, the in-between spots. They'll have a gazillion microphones at their disposal, each with its own special purpose and personality, so to speak. They've got all manner of effects, a huge board all wired up to connect all the tricks of their trade with everything you're playing. And some studios are stocked with instruments and amps and other gear for every occasion and an intimate knowledge of when these sounds might prove useful. It's pretty mind-boggling, and it takes a great deal of intensive time for an engineer to absorb all of this knowledge and craft, become one with their space, 
and make it happen. Plus, they got to put up with the musicians and producers stress and pathologies for hours and days on end. A musician can stand around for hours watching the studio techs pull cables and mics and baffles and headphones and position amps and get all this stuff wired up before a note is ever played. So it, it behooves a musician to either know that they're going to find all of this fascinating and take an interest in everything that's being done around them, or if they really can't take that, they need to go someplace and stay out of the way until it's go time. In our case, recording Memphis for Breakfast, I already mentioned John Alasia, who was, and still is, brilliant at this kind of thing. And there were a bunch of amazing folks at Arden, not surprisingly, chief among them the lead engineer that we worked with, Tom Loney. There's a lot I wasn't around for, have forgotten, but some of the highlights uh, I remember were things like when Tom pulled an ancient Gibson hollow body and an equally ancient tube amp out of a closet, both of which I ended up using on uh, Heaven Knows Enola and What She Wants. Tom just instinctively knew that that was the kind of noise that I should be making on those songs. And to this day, I don't think I've ever played anything that, to me, is as truly memphistic as those sounds. I have to laugh, because if you listen to Enola, as I have a lot of times, it's almost comical how flat I played some of those notes. It would be kind of sad, except that at the time, I think we thought it sounded authentic and greasy enough that the intonation was a secondary concern. The other thing uh, that was remarkable about Arden is that they were, for the time, pretty much as state-of-the-art as you could as you could get. Most of us in that era were used to recording to analog magnetic tape. And so how many tracks you had to work with was dependent on how wide the tape was, and while you could re redo things numerous times, you had to worry at some point about the tape degrading. And of course, nowadays, there's no tape. Even if we're recording in a room at home, everything's computerized and digitized with space limitations that are just down to hard disk space or cloud storage. So Arden in 1991, though, was at a state-of-the-art point where, you know, what was the, the top line was in between all that. They used digital tape, computer applications for mixing and editing. And I remember being floored by the fact that they could automate mixing by telling the computer, you know, where they wanted things to fade in and fade out on a song. And the computer would operate the faders rather than the engineer. They'd just go by themselves. So I think the program was actually called Flying Faders. And... You know, at the time, it gave uh, me, I don't know about everybody else, it gave me this sort of childlike sense of wonder about the whole thing. Arden also had a terrific studio cat. Everybody loved Tristan, and uh, Tristan seemed to love everybody back. Memphis is, as I said before, well, at least to me, probably to a lot of us, a sort of a mythical city of music. It's smack in the Mid-South on, you know, the big river, and it spawned Sun Studios and Stacks and Arden. So much rockabilly, rhythm and blues, Elvis, Box Tops, Big Star, and so on. And I remember, though, taking, being taken aback by how cold it was. I mean, it was early November. Sometimes it's still kind of warmish here in D.C. at that time of year. And I thought we'd fly into something a bit warmer, but it was bitter, freezing, windy outside. I think when Antoine got there, he said it was snowing. I know there was snow on the ground when I arrived a couple of days later. And I'd flown straight from work that day, and I didn't even think to pack another pair of shoes. I just had the black shoes I had on from the office that whole weekend. Not, not the best for icy sidewalks, but we weren't going out much. It was my first trip to Memphis, and aside from the cab ride to and from the airport, I really only saw about three square blocks of the whole place. And that was when we uh, ventured out one evening while Kevin was recording vocals so that yours truly could enjoy some proper Memphis ribs at the rendezvous. But other than that, for me, it was airport to studio, to hotel, back to studio, back to hotel, back to studio, back to airport with uh, side trips to the hotel breakfast bar. I made a point of visiting Memphis several times over the next bunch of years so I could really see the place. So I got around to that. Like I said earlier, the days were long. I don't remember whether it was the first or second night I was there, but somewhere around 1 a.m., I think, Eric and I were recording backing vocals for one of the tunes, and I really just thought I was going to fall asleep on my feet. Um, that's what the dance moves were about. It was really, we were trying to stay awake when uh, no amount of coffee was going to serve as the cure. And one of the things, too, you know, to take note of is that ardent like studios of that time, you know, had space. I mentioned the room before, but these days, you know, people record digitally um, in, in small spaces. And the big studios, I think, to some extent, are kind of falling on hard times. Um, but, the, you know, there's nothing like room sound 
and and setting up in a room and playing and they did all the rhythm tracks that way Antoine and Eric and Kevin did and I think that's probably what really brings that record alive is that that's a band okay. or most of a band playing okay. together right. at the same time in the same room I was always very proud of that record I think we all were especially when you consider how quickly we pulled it off it's hard to go in under those kinds of circumstances and just nail it um, but we did and there's always something you wish had gone better I still remember the last morning I was there my heart pounding feeling sweat on my forehead from frustration because I just couldn't get the slide part on Marlena where I wanted it but I had a date with a cab and a date with a plane and I just had to push on through honestly I was never happy with that particular part to this day I wince at it when I hear it but the record overall made me really happy I mean, great songs um, well played comes alive I think in in that true band way you know still almost 30 years later and it was the first thing like that I'd ever done and I, I honestly have had only a few experiences to equal it since then it was an invaluable learning experience for me because I, I took away from it the importance of walking into a place like that knowing your stuff but being open to changes and remaining graceful under pressure managing your energy being patient especially when things aren't falling into place musically or technically I found just two days of that exhausting, so I w was always in awe of how Kevin and Eric stuck it out for all five, mixing everything, plus all the driving to and from. When I walked into Arden that very first day, within just a few moments of watching them operate, I saw in microcosm what it took to make this kind of thing work. Kevin was in a remote sealed space trying to wrap his head around a vocal line to get it just as he wanted it. Eric was in the studio, uh, you know, mixing room and the, at the board, patiently, soothingly encouraging Kevin while also maintaining detailed notes of takes and phrases and time markers. John and Tom and some of the other guys that worked there were hopping up to reset mics and settings, attending to details that I'd never have appreciated if I hadn't been there. Thirty years later, I'm still friends with all of these guys, and I still get to play with them sometimes. Antoine and I are still in the D.C. area. And, and play in different vans, but we get to do projects together from time to time, which is wonderful. And in fact, in the mid-20-teens, Kevin reconstituted the lineman with Antoine and me and Jonathan Gregg in New York and Scott McKnight, and we got to do a lot of great shows and record in another big, cool studio all in the same room at the same time to get that real band feel. And so I still look back over 30 years and think that it's so wonderful to still have these friends and these bonds and while I wouldn't say of the Arden recording experience that's it that was the uh, that was the defining moment that's where it all started it started a long time before that it was a very defining moment and one that I think back on is very significant 30 years later considering how we've all hung together <laughs> Winding down, I have to say. 